You're watching Sky News. In just a moment, the press preview. Our first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. First, though, our top stories here tonight. And three more patients test positive for COVID-19 in the UK, including the first case in Northern Ireland, bringing the total number of cases to 16. The UK has warned the EU it will walk away from Brexit trade talks in June unless there's a broad outline of a deal. And the candidates vying to be Labour's next leader clash this evening over who did the most to try to end the party's anti-Semitism crisis. Hello there, you're watching The Press Preview, our first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. Over the next half an hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with Sonia Soda and Ali Miraj. So, good evening to you two. So let's take a look then at what's making the front pages and the Metro carries a story about a man who's returned from Milan and fears he has COVID-19 being told to go to hospital instead of self-isolating at home. The Financial Times reports on the impact the virus outbreak is having on US and European stock markets. The Guardian carries the same warning. They say it might be as damaging as the 2008 crisis. Well, the Telegraph talks of the knock-on effects it could have on sports events and music festivals this year. The Times also leads on that possibility, saying the illness could spread for months. Meanwhile, the Daily Mail reports on the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. It says that Canada will stop paying for the couple's security after they step down as working royals at the end of next month. So papers still coming in all the time, of course. We'll bring those to you as they, as they do arrive. Um, the Observer's Chief Leader writer, Sonia Soda, and uh, the columnist at the article, Annie Mirage, here with me. And a lot of headlines about coronavirus, mm. as you would imagine, because it's a story that's changing yeah. all the time. It is. Uh, there's the Daily Telegraph's uh, front page uh, with a, a striking headline and a striking image as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So the Telegraph focuses on um, major events, maybe being having to be put on hold for two months, schools perhaps being closed for up to two months months which you're talking about in this country in, the in this country exactly so huge disruption for parents and i think this would have taken a lot of people by surprise so when f news first broke about coronavirus it was very much kind of a story on the other side of the world in china and actually a lot of people said well it's only a matter of time before it starts to spread and indeed that's kind of proved to be the case i think it's worth commenting on the image on the front as well of the telegraph so it's um the pope holding a hanky up to his nose and apparently he had to cancel an engagement today um after doing an event on um ash wednesday a mass where he shook hands with multiple people and he's feeling unwell and the Vatican are refusing to say whether he's been tested or not for coronavirus. And I think this really kind of shows you, it, I mean, there's nobody who sort of, it, it might not touch. And in Iran, for example, we've seen a couple of um, very high profile politicians being infected with coronavirus. We've just heard that the vice president for women's affairs has been infected with coronavirus. Um, so really, you know, I think it, it just goes to show it, it is spreading. The, 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 I think the thing to remember, though, about coronavirus is that although it's more infectious than a, a virus like SARS, it actually doesn't appear to be anywhere near as serious. So it's very hard to be accurate about death rates because partly because it can be quite mild in some people. So some, a lot of people might not even know that they have it, which makes it hard to calculate the death rate. But experts think the death rate is somewhere between one to two percent. So not that far off flu. That's true. But the, the, the risk is, I guess, because it's infectious or, or relatively easy mm. to catch, relatively yeah. easy, uh, more people, more people get, get scooped get up in yeah. it. Yeah. And, and just to pick up on what um, Professor Chris Whitty, the yeah. Chief Medical Officer mm. was saying, you used the expression just a matter of time. It's one that he's used himself, uh, hasn't he, mm. about the UK. Mm. But this idea of schools possibly closing is one they haven't decided on, have no. they? They've, no. they've kind of said it may or may not be appropriate. They haven't, they, they don't know yet. That's right. I, I think schools are taking their own individual decisions at the moment. I think in, in all this, I mean, look, it, it's a very rapidly developing story. I do think we have to be careful about being too alarmist, though. What we, what we want to do is to be sensible, measured, have everything in place to respond quickly. But alarmist language is not helpful. I mean, Emmanuel Macron's quoted as saying, you know, we have a crisis before us. Um, and that's not particularly helpful because we want to calm nerves at this time. But yes, the, um, the Six Nations uh, contest between uh, Italy and Ireland has been postponed. Uh, not sure when it's going to take place. It could affect... Um, you know, other other sporting events as well. So it is going to have an impact. 
And it's also having an impact on financial markets as well now. Well, that's right. Uh, we well. can move on to that, can't we? Because that's yeah. in some of the other newspapers as yeah. well. So the, I think the, the FT... Guardian. Uh, yeah, the Guardian. Well, yeah, let's the, take a look at the Guardian. Yeah, the, the Guardian. FT as yeah. well after that. Yeah. So there's uh, the Guardian. Coronavirus may be as damaging to the global economy as the 2008 crisis. Well, indeed. And, and, and you can see that it has wiped off, uh, I think they're saying 150 billion off uh, uh, UK stocks at the moment. Uh, so it is, it, it is causing jitters in markets uh, at the moment. Uh, and they were actually on an all-time high. Now, we've, we've heard from uh, uh, President Trump the other day that all is well because Mike Pence is in charge there, but he's got an election coming up, so he's going to be a little bit concerned. And obviously over here, you know, with a new government in place, people want the economy to do well. So this is not particularly helpful. Uh, and again, we need to sort of calm uh, markets and uh, ensure that people don't get too jittery unnecessarily at this stage. Uh, because it, it is having an effect. Well, yes, and let's just t take a look at the jitter, shall we? Because it is on the front mm. of the Financial Times. Uh, they go through the various markets, as you would imagine the FT to focus on, um, and they talk about the FTSE, for example, being down 8% uh, there, and mm. it's the biggest uh, points fall uh, on the Dow mm. Jones in, in yeah. America, in New York. Yeah. Um, in history. Yeah, and this is because, you know, investors will be sort of pricing in what they think might happen mm. in the weeks and months to come. So the very real impacts that it could have on the economy, the Guardian reports that, you know, several companies are sort of issuing statements that their profits might not be as healthy. Uh, companies like, I think it was um, Microsoft, PayPal and Standard Chartered. Um, if you just imagine, you know, on a very basic level, if schools cl were to close for two months, no one's saying that's going to happen, but it's part of the contingency planning, then what happens to parents who need to go to work? So all that stuff is going to have big knock-on impacts on, on the economy. On tourism, if, if events get cancelled, people need to be refunded tickets. So all this stuff will start to feed through. And I think this is why we're starting to see some of these yeah. impacts on the markets. The thing I will say as well is it's not just kind of the economy that people are worried about. So um, there's also been a lot of reporting over the last couple of days about the NHS and the NHS's capability to deal with sort of, you know, something on the scale of, say, the 2008 swine flu um, epidemic. And what doctors are saying is that the NHS is so stretched. You know, we've yeah. seen it at the tightest ever funding settlement for the NHS over the last decade. And it just doesn't have some of the capacity that it had in the system around 2008. We've got fewer intensive care beds, um, staffing levels are much tighter than ever. There's so little leeway in the NHS at the moment. You've got hospitals regularly hitting the sort of maximum safe bed capacity limits that doctors are really worried that, you know, on an individual level, they say, you know, there's not much to worry about because lots of people, if they contract this virus, will be OK. But on a system level for the NHS, if you've got a lot of extra demand on the system, it could really be bad for the health service. And it's one of the reasons that we hear about um, the, the hope that, w that if there is an, an outbreak, a bigger yeah. outbreak here, that it can be delayed in some way, because obviously there's more pressure on the NHS during mm. the winter months, and if you can at least uh, yes, delay that until exactly. the summer, the NHS would be in the best I, I mean, I, th I think we hear that the NHS is it's got contingencies in place and it's pretty well equipped, but Sonia makes a very good point. I mean, the NHS has got very little wriggle room in it anyway, and is always under pressure at, um, in, in the winter, and it's extremely cold at the moment, uh, so even more pressure's on it. So it, it is a concern. Um, the government has to be aware of that. I'm sure contingencies are in place, but I, do, I just think we need to take one step at a time. I think if people are going away um, and they've come back from areas that have been affected, they should self-isolate. I mean, there was a story about, you know, one person calling the National, uh, National Service Health Service helpline and then being told to go and wait in A&E surrounded by other people, which makes no sense at all. Um, so we have to be a bit careful and a bit sensible about how we, how we go about it. That's right. So uh, certainly one that we're going to hear a lot more about mm. uh, in the days uh, to come. Let's just move on to one other issue um, in the papers um, before we get to the break. And this is um, in the Metro here. Um, it's June or bust. And this is mm. all about mm. Britain laying out uh, some mm. of its uh, terms. So this is a massive court. political story of the day. Uh, this is the week where we've seen the EU lay out what it calls its negotiating mandate. So that's the mandate it gives to its negotiators to negotiate the terms of our final relationship with the EU during this year. It's got to be done by December 2020. And today is a day when the government sort of published its own statement and its own position. And there's been a lot of talking up of this. I mean, I think this is 
rhetoric that is going to sound incredibly familiar to Sky viewers. We had the government in the run up to the last general election say repeatedly, no deal is better than a bad deal, we'll take no deal, um, playing really, really hardball with the EU, just in some ways as the EU has been playing hardball with us. And we've seen more of the same today. So um, but, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough stance. I think it's um, it's not great. I think actually, if you look at these two documents and see the distance between them, it really does bring home the chance of a no deal Brexit at the end of December, which would be absolutely catastrophic for the economy. So it's really quite worrying, I think, that the government is taking this tough line. And most worryingly of all is Northern Ireland. And we've had incredibly mixed messages from the government about whether the government will stick to the legally binding treaty it signed, the withdrawal agreement with the EU on Northern Ireland, avoiding a border on the island of Ireland and, and customs checks. It's very unclear. You've got government ministers saying different things. So I think a lot of people concerned about the future of Northern Ireland will be very worried about but that. I, I do, look, I think it's, uh, it's skirmishing around. I mean, people are, it's a bit like two heavyweight boxers in a ring, you know, dancing around before the actual, they strike each other. I mean, that's what's basically happening here. The government's laying out its position very clearly. This whole idea of alignment, uh, it's been very clear about. I mean, there was no point Brexiting if you are going to dynamically align or align in any way with EU rules. Now, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a race to the bottom on workers' rights, on other protections that are here. But it does mean that the UK does need to be able to set its own trade policy, its own policy on uh, fisheries, etc., which uh, I think Michael Goh has been very clear about the fact that there'll be an annual discussion going on about this. It needs to do that. Otherwise, there was no point... Uh, having a Brexit and leaving if we're going to be so closely aligned that we're just rule takers and might, might as well have stayed in. The, but the problem with that analysis is that in our in this day and age, in a very interconnected world, there's no such thing as having total national sovereignty over your rules and regulations. You're always going to have to do trade deals with other countries but, but, yeah. in, in order to do well as an economy. So, you know, there's a choice. Do we want to be a rule taker from the EU and align with their standards? Or do we want to be a rule taker from the US in a trade deal with the US? I, 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 that means accepting things like chlorinated chicken, um, we got there. lifting of drug price well, regulation for the well, NHS. Speculation but, is absolutely, that that might... but there is, there's no world where Britain can sort of be a sort of Britannia rules the seas, 19th century, we set all our own rules and regulations. Any country looking to do a trade deal with you that's much larger than you sure, can expect but, but, some form sure, of alignment. So I, it sure, just but, 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 sure, sure, Sonia, but there is a difference between a Canada-style free trade deal and an Australia-style free trade deal. I mean, the Canada-style free trade deal, I mean, Canada is, is a able to set its own trade policy, set its own uh, position on workers' rights, whatever it may be. And that's exactly what the, the UK wants to have. Now, it's up to the EU how it responds. I mean, the EU's got quite a lot of its own problems at the moment because it can't actually agree a budget since the UK has left. So they've also got issues to deal with. And it's, in, it's not in the EU's interest to have a situation where they have uh, problems uh, on borders with, with the UK. They sell us a lot of stuff themselves. So th there's a choice between a Canada-style agreement or an Australia-style agreement, which is effectively no deal and you go to WTO rules. That's not what the government wants. It wants a Canada-style agreement, and it, that's what it's putting out there. So, so how likely do you think that a deal can be well, done, I think, given the I think, government I think, says they need the, to make real progress by June? Well, I think, the good thing, I think the good thing is there's not a lot of time. I mean, this has to be... I mean, by June, we need to know which direction we're going in. And by December, the thing needs to be concluded. So actually, this is now focusing minds. And they know that Boris Johnson has an 80-seat majority. He can deliver what he's saying in Parliament, which is totally different to where we were last year. Quick thought, do you think something will be struck by June? Um, I think it only will. I think it will actually mean that the UK has to give way. I don't think that the EU are going to give way on this. And I think if the UK doesn't give way, we will end up in a no-deal scenario and it would be incredibly damaging. And I think it's up to our government whether they take us there or not. OK, let's take a break. Uh, coming up, uh, Heathrow's third runway ruled unlawful. We're going to be talking about the airport's expansion or not after the break. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me tonight, Sonia Soda and Ali Mirage. Um, and we're going to go back to the front page of the Financial Times because the second story has caught your eye as well. And it's mm. all about a ruling about Heathrow today. Yeah. Well, I think this is uh, essentially what's happened is the High Court has said a, a, a case was brought by various environmental campaigners on the grounds that the government did not take into account its own climate change targets uh, in relation to the third runway at Heathrow and the, and the Court of Appeal has ruled in favour, basically saying that there cannot be a third runway at Heathrow. Now, 
Heathrow Airport's going to appeal this, this decision, but the government has said it will not appeal it. Now, this is, quite, this is quite handy for Boris Johnson, who said that he would lie down in front of bulldozers. I mean, he is the Member of Parliament for Uxbridge, which is very close to, uh, to Heathrow, so this kind of gets him off the hook quite neatly for now. But this raises a bigger question for me between the, the uh, trade-off between wanting to be global Britain in a post-Brexit world and our climate change uh, issues and, and, and uh, um, things that we have to face up to. I mean, we've got COP26 coming uh, later this year. We've got the River Severn about to burst its banks. You know, so, so climate change is a serious and pressing issue. But yet, on the other side, we do need to face up to the fact that we do need to be out there trading with the world. I mean, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam has got six runways. Frankfurt has got four. And we're, we're still messing around. Five years after the Davis Review in 2015 said that there should be a third Royal Mate Heathrow, we're still messing around with this issue. Do you agree that there is a tension there between our commitments under the Paris Agreement and global Britain? I mean, I think there's a bit of a tension, but only if you take quite an old-fashioned view of what it means to sort of trade globally and do business with the rest of the world. I think, you know, there's a really strong argument that with the levels of technology we've got in this day and age, we should be, you know, looking to... People shouldn't be flying around the world to do business. They should be using Skype. And to be honest, I think if the government invested far more heavily, our broadband network is absolutely dreadful when you compare it to countries like Spain or South Korea or Japan in terms of reliability and speed. If you had the government investing in that instead, maybe it would reduce the need for business travel. I think the other thing it's important to say is if you look at Heathrow, the vast majority of flights from Heathrow actually aren't business flights. They're flights by tourists. And look, we all love going on holiday. I know I really like it. I'm probably not as uh, cognizant myself of uh, the cost, the environmental cost of taking holidays. Um, but we, we shouldn't be expanding capacity for people to fly more and more and more for leisure, I think. I think we should be encouraging people to take greener holidays and closer to home and more in the but, UK but, but, to quickly, get yeah. trains. Yeah, but, 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 then, but then we need HS2. I mean, we need to face oh, up yeah, to I the infrastructure with, challenges. Oh, I agree we with have, that. Right? I agree so, with that. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I think we should have been investing far more in infrastructure, but I question whether air infrastructure, given the climate challenge, is the place to be investing. And I completely the, the, agree with you on HS2. I think we need much better okay. rail infrastructure. The reality is, we're at 80 million passengers at Heathrow. It's a capacity. We need more runway capacity in the southeast. OK, uh, let's move on, shall we, because and try and squeeze in one more story. This is on the front of the Daily Mail, and it's the latest in uh, the fallout from Harry and Meghan opting out of the royal family yeah. um, and their new role. So yeah. uh, what's yeah. the line they're taking? So, so, um, so essentially, Canada has now said, so there was always a question mark, if Harry and Meghan spend most of their time in Canada, who on earth is going to pay for their security? Is a Canadian taxpayer going to pick it up? Is a British taxpayer going to pick up the bill? And Canada has now come out and said it's... It's paid the Royal Security Bill for the last few months, which actually I don't think we officially knew, and that they're not going to do it anymore. And I have to say, I can't really blame the Canadian taxpayer. It doesn't really feel like our mm. royal family is up to... The, I mean, yeah. Harry and Meghan and Archie have got high security requirements for obvious reasons. Don't see why the Canadian taxpayer should be having to pay for it. But I also not quite sure why the British taxpayer necessarily needs to pay okay. for it. And, and, and that's the inevitable alternative. Well, isn't yeah, it, it is. They and do it, need security. And it's the latest twist in a very sorry saga, uh, to be honest, uh, that, that's uh, occurring here. We had the, the whole issue with the, the, the title, whether they could use Sussex Royals, now we have this. But I do agree with you, Sonia. I don't believe that the Canadians should be paying for it, nor should we. OK, on that note, we must leave it. But lots more to talk about again at 11.30 for the moment. Thank you.